Good to see that you all survived the night and are back um, this morning. Uh, we're in for a special treat. This is a um, this is an opportunity, I think, uh, for us to think about uh, the next steps uh, after uh, talking and spending a lot of time about what kinds of programs can be demonstrated to have good scientific evidence for their effectiveness and understanding what works. Um, but this morning's speaker, uh, Dean Fixon, is uh, probably the leading um, research expert on the uh, what's called translational work around uh, promoting evidence-based programs. That is, how do we implement these programs? How do we disseminate them? How do we deal and understand the selection process that's involved in uh, selecting programs, and how do we think about or understand and promote the sustainability of these programs. So that next step, which is so critical, being able to disseminate, implement programs with fidelity, influence the selection process of those programs, and ensure sustainability, those are the critical issues. And Dean Fixon is probably the, the country's leading expert on those issues. So it's a special privilege for us to have Dean here this morning to talk to us. Dean and I go back to the Middle Ages. <laughs> so we, we for a long time, have known each other, although there have been periods of time which we haven't had much contact. But uh, we were working together early with the Achievement Place model, which was developed, and Dean played a, a key role in that, um, that uh, Boys Town was using back in the, in the early days. Uh, so we've had this, um, this relationship for a long time looking at uh, evidence-based programs. We didn't call them that back in those days, but good programs that were designed uh, to work with those children and families uh, that were having uh, difficulties and struggling to get through a normal, healthy developmental process. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dean Fixon. Let's give him a warm welcome this morning. Thank you very much. All those things that uh, Dell just said, I was thinking, God, I should have put more stuff in that slideshow because I'm not sure I'm going to cover all those topics. So, But um, the uh, title here is meant to uh, provoke a little thought, uh, Evidence-Based Programs, a Failed Experiment, uh, or the Future of Human Services. So, uh, and... Uh, I thought I could get by with this because we have a pretty sophisticated audience uh, here. Uh, I, I'm the one at the podium, but as you can see uh, on our co-authors here, these are the folks who are uh, the uh, real uh, uh, force behind uh, implementation science and uh, members of our National Implementation Research Network. As soon as uh, Sharon uh, Mahalik uh, called and said, uh, we'd like to have you be a speaker, um, even in that conversation and in probably 20 conversations since then, uh, people have said, you know, Karen Blasey was here last time, and she was so good. I mean, she was funny. She had terrific content. She, she was wonderful. And the implication being, I, I wonder if you can kind of live up uh, to all of that. Uh, so <clears throat> Karen Blasey, for those of you who have not met her, uh, this is an uh, earlier picture, uh, but uh, so so I but I've I've had this going on now for the last couple of months. Uh, you know, Karen, this Karen, that she was so wonderful. You know, kind of looking at me. Uh, so um, so anyway, my my entire goal today uh, I actually have two. Uh, one is I'd like to convey some information about uh, implementation science and what we're learning. Uh, the other thing is I would like to have some reasonably favorable comparison with Karen when we're uh, done here because uh, she is way smarter than I am and uh, does uh, way better work and I've learned uh, a ton from her over the many years. So, um, so uh, But I, I just hope to measure up uh, in a modest way to uh, the example that she set here uh, a couple of years ago. So the golden age. The golden age of research in human services 
Uh, during this time, the field's been dominated by the randomized control experimental paradigm. A key lesson from the golden age is that the effects of social programs and practice uh, hover near zero. So we have all of these wonderful randomized control trials. We're not seeing much uh, evidence of their use in practice to make uh, socially significant changes. Consequence of these findings is a recognition of the importance of implementation. So here we are looking at implementation then as a possible uh, critical piece uh, for all of this. And this golden age that was being described was back in the 1960s, 70s, uh, and 80s. This, these uh, statements I just read are taken from a summary provided by Rossi and Wright in 1984. The golden age started with the uh, Kennedy administration uh, when there, many of you in the room are too young to know, uh, but this is where deinstitutionalization uh, began. Uh, community mental health centers uh, started uh, and the, uh, in the Johnson administration, uh, the Great Society programs came along. Uh, still one of the largest social experiments ever carried out in the United States of America, uh, the Great Society programs. And all of that ended uh, six months after Reagan took office. And for those of us, uh, Dell and others, who were uh, very much a part of this golden age, uh, it was a, uh, uh, quite a shock uh, to have the billions and billions of dollars worth of uh, interventions and finally the implementation supports for those interventions that were just coming uh, into their own wiped out completely uh, in six months. I mean, it was there one day and literally gone the next. And so um, uh, I, I was never sure that we would recover uh, from that. It was so devastating, everybody who had collected uh, was dispersed. But that was the golden age. Here I am uh, as a participant uh, in that golden age. <clears throat> uh, some things are timeless. I mean, it is just, uh, uh, I still have the pants. I could have, should have, I suppose, worn them today, except they're made out of wool and be kind of warm here for San Antonio. But, uh, but Back in those days, as Dell just mentioned, we were working on developing uh, what uh, in those days uh, would have been an evidence-based program. Certainly had a lot of research behind it. Uh, teaching family program, these were group homes, uh, kids uh, from the delinquency system uh, that were there. Uh, our first implementation failure, we did four years worth of fantastic research. Uh, we then uh, started to try to replicate that, fell on our face. Uh, that was our first implementation failure in 1971. Uh, fortunately, we had a couple of other places that were up and running, and, uh, uh, and we were able to learn how to be more successful, and finally, uh, many more. So the first uh, 792 uh, attempted replications of the teaching family program uh, are represented there in that uh, particular chart. Next door to us at the University of Kansas was the National Follow-Through Program. Head Start had been funded as part of the Great Society programs. Uh, kids were still not quite ready for school, so follow through then was uh, K through three uh, grades uh, in school. Uh, another huge funded, hugely funded, million, billions of dollars back in the days when a billion dollars was actually a lot of money uh, invested in this. And here are the results of the independent evaluation done uh, later in the sequence. Direct instruction, DISTAR it was, as it was called then, but direct instruction for literacy was the clear winner. Anything on the right-hand side of the median line here, uh, those are effect sizes uh, on the positive side. They were having a dramatic impact on basic skills, cognitive abilities, affective skills of kids in those classrooms. All the ones at the bottom, uh, those are standard deviations in a negative way. Uh, these are uh, programs that were being funded, being used in schools, and producing harmful outcomes for children uh, in those classrooms. Uh, our big lesson, uh, we were so excited as we were, because follow through, the, the behavior analysis follow through program was at the University of Kansas, and they were in the room right next door to us down in the basement where they used to hold the cadavers and a few other things for biology, but we won't go there. 
But, uh, uh, but we had a lot of correspondence with them just to see, you know, what it is they're doing, what it is that we're learning about implementation. Uh, so we were pretty excited to see these data. It was kind of direct instruction. This is, this is going to be the wave of the future for education. Uh, and 10 years later, what is it that uh, was it adopted then and used in schools, uh, thousands of schools all over the United States? You guessed it. It's all the stuff at the bottom. Because that fit with the philosophy of education, having an open education, getting kids together to teach one another, having teachers get together to help one another uh, in that process. That had a lot of appeal uh, to people. Direct instruction was a lot of work. Uh, you had to go in and you had to actually teach kids and there were schedules for that and there were measures of whether you're doing it or not. Uh, direct instruction then and now, uh, quite effective. Uh, but that was not uh, used uh, uh, widely in education and it still has an uphill battle uh, today. So this was a big lesson for us. Having the data is insufficient. You can have fantastic data generated uh, in a manner like this, uh, lots of money behind it, uh, but this was not enough to have uh, education improved, educational outcomes for students improved. So in the new golden age, the evidence-based program movement is itself an international experiment. There's no data that says if we make use of evidence-based programs, it's going to produce any benefits. So we are engaged in an international experiment. There's, we don't have randomized control trials that say if we do this uh, that it's going to. Uh, so it, our, our approach to uh, this evidence-based program movement is nowhere uh, on the blueprints list. But the purpose is clear. The purpose is to produce greater benefits to children, families, individuals, and society. So just like the great society programs, just like the first golden age, the second golden age is all about achieving socially significant outcomes. And that's the point we'll return to. So let's look at the evidence-based program movement. So first, evidence-based. So just, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds uh, to think about what defines evidence, okay? So time, start now. Okay, time's up. Uh, how many of you said, show of hands, two or more high quality randomized control trials, maybe some, how many, raise hands, I'm gonna see them. Okay, quite a few. A lot of you must be eating. Um, preferably done by two or more independent research groups and preferably summarized in meta-analyses. I, I had all this up before I heard uh, Dale yesterday, but I was happy to hear that we were <laughs> still on, in sync around this stuff. So a lot of people in the audience here know a lot about what defines evidence. Uh, now, and, for the, and we should, because for the past uh, decade now, the National Institutes of Health have invested over $100 billion a year, times 10 is a trillion dollars, uh, to develop evidence-based programs. That has been uh, the focus of that uh, research. And if you add in other federal agencies and philanthropies, that number goes up uh, substantially. So now let's look at program. So we're gonna do the same 10 seconds. Uh, so what defines a program? Okay, start. And we're gonna have another show of hands here in a second. All right, your time's up. So how many said we need a clear description of what the program is? Uh, what, it's a, what is the philosophy behind this? What, what are the values? What are the principles that guide this? What are the inclusion, exclusion criteria for people uh, who will benefit from the program? How many said that? A few, all right, good. Uh, how many said that we need to identify the essential functions that define the program? How is this program any different than any other program? Here are the things that really define it. These are the core elements, the essential ingredients, as some people call them, and that those things have been linked to outcomes. So how many thought that that was it? Got a few of those, all right. And we need operational definitions of those essential components. What would practitioners do? What would, what would they say? And if we were to go look at a 
clinician or a, a classroom teacher, what would we see when we were there? So how, how many thought operational definitions? All right, we got a few. Um, evidence that it's effective. We want to know that this uh, program is effective so that it is worth all the effort we're going to put into uh, having this be used with fidelity. How many thought evidence? Okay, a few more there. A practical performance assessment, sometimes known as fidelity, that is highly correlated, and we're suggesting 0.7 correlation, uh, with outcomes. How many said that you have to, if to be an evidence-based program, to, to be a program, uh, you have to have a fidelity assessment. So, okay, well, more. All right, that's encouraging. But here we have uh, a definition of what a program is uh, that we think needs to be included in every uh, review. What it turns out, as we looked at the data, about 18% of outcome studies, they, they looked at about uh, 1,200 more. I lost count after a while. Might be closer to 1,500. Uh, but about 18% of these outcome studies had any assessment of the independent variable. Do, do you even know what it is that you are doing in practice to produce the outcomes that you are studying? And 18% had an answer uh, to that. About 7% of those 1,200 plus uh, linked those essential components. They, they actually measured the independent variable and said, Yes, it is or is not producing uh, the outcomes uh, over here uh, for children, families, or adults, or communities. Few studies measure fidelity, and fewer yet link fidelity to outcomes. So on the program side, we are remiss. We are far behind uh, where we need to be in terms of knowing what it is we're doing, what is the independent variable, and what are the outcomes of that, and how can we detect this thing in practice? Where is our measure of fidelity? How do we know that it's there? Uh, and how do we know how strongly uh, it is there? So right now, we know a lot about scientific rigor. Uh, the problem is that standards for rigor are not used by practitioners to impact children, families, adults, communities. So we know a lot about that. We don't know much about programs. but. Uh, programs are what practitioners do use to affect change uh, at the practice level. So uh, it's nice that we have the information on scientific rigor. It's nice that we have this information on uh, programs and the uh, benefits of those uh, in scientific studies. Uh, but from an imp and remember, I'm coming at this from an implementation point of view. <clears throat> if we really want to produce the outcomes that are there for uh, this uh, international experiment, <clears throat> around evidence-based programs, we need to see this stuff used in practice on a scale that's going to make a difference. And that's where the program part comes in. So let's look at movement. So we have evidence-based program movement. So to move science into practice, our history has been uh, an letting it happen and helping it happen. And this Hall and Hoard in education, uh, Green Hall and colleagues uh, did, did a wonderful review. Uh, we picked up on this and, uh, and really applied it to uh, implementation more broadly. But letting it happen is where researchers uh, do the research, they publish the findings, uh, it's in the journal. Uh, hey, it's up to you guys to read it, figure out what, what it is we did. Uh, read the methods section, that's all you need to know about the intervention, uh, and go forth and do good. Uh, make good use of that. But it, you're responsible for uh, looking it up, understanding it, and then putting it into practice. The, let, the helping it happen, uh, since letting it happen has not worked all that well, uh, the helping it happen uh, is that, well, we're also going to have websites. We're going to have uh, uh, manuals, we're going to use uh, simpler language, we're going to do sequences, we're going to do training, we're going to do lots of things to help you uh, understand this thing better uh, so that you then can go put it uh, into practice. But you still are accountable uh, for uh, uh, having this uh, actually produce the intended benefits for 
uh, children, families, and the individuals. These are the do-it-yourself approaches. I mean, this is the Lowe's and uh, Home Depot approach to uh, getting uh, evidence-based uh, stuff uh, into practice. Um, let's look at this just for a minute. Gosh, my ears just popped, and I can now hear for the first time in two days. I love it. <laughs> Have I been speaking loudly? I don't know. But now I can hear. Wonderful. So here, here's a study that just came out from the U.S. Department of Education. They were looking at mental health and substance abuse pro, uh, prevention programs being done in schools, 5,847 schools. They found that there were, on average, nine innovations, nine of these prevention programs that were being attempted uh, in each school, nine per school times 5,000 schools. That's a lot. 7.8% of those had an evidence base uh, behind them. So even if you were to do those nine innovations really, really well, uh, only 7.8% had any evidence to say that if you were to do it well, you would get a desired uh, positive impact on students. Um, and 3.5% used with fidelity. So here, here's, the, here's the world out there in uh, uh, where we all live uh, in the practice world. Uh, these are students, these are in schools. Uh, we have similar information from clinics and health is a whole other story, but not unlike what we're looking at here. A typical sequence, uh, the RAND Corporation did some studies, fantastic information, really recommend all of this. But in the evidence base on the left-hand side, uh, when they were doing the randomized control trials for these comprehensive school reforms, and comprehensive school reforms uh, are the evidence-based programs of education. But uh, in doing those, every teacher was trained, every teacher was continually supported. So the, uh, the study here was to uh, ask for volunteer uh, schools, uh, and lots of schools across the country uh, volunteered, uh, they then had this menu of possible uh, comprehensive school reforms, pick the one that best fits your school situation, they did, uh, and then uh, Rand started tracking to see what happened. Well, in years one to three, uh, fewer than half the teachers received some, not all, training. Fewer than 25% uh, received any kind of follow-up support, and consequently, when they looked in years four and five at what happened, Fewer than 10% of the schools used the comprehensive school reform as intended, and therefore the vast majority of students did not benefit. And this, this 5 to 10 to 15% outcome is something we see over and over and over again, and not just in human services, but in other fields as well. Uh, that somehow or the other, in that that uh, letting it happen, helping it happen category of things where you're putting stuff out there, you're leaving it up, up to the recipients to figure it out, uh, 5, 10, 15 percent do. Uh, they do figure it out. They do find a way of making good use of this. And for as long as those people are around, that program probably will be functioning and effective. When those people leave, uh, we're not sure that it's going to be sustained. So. The other thing I want to talk about a bit is on the policy side. So here we are in the, the uh, uh, letting it happen, uh, helping it happen category. And this is what also uh, is being used uh, by the federal government. Uh, this is a, uh, an initiative that was done in the 90s, uh, $500 million invested in family support services. Uh, no implementation supports were provided. They only funded the intervention, nothing about uh, inter implementation or any kind of support for the implementation. Uh, a real problem was that no fidelity criteria were insisted upon by the developers. All this was kind of based on home builders as the uh, foundation uh, evidence-based program. Of course, the national evaluation uh, and in the uh, year five found uh, that there was this uh, program was not effective, so this is another one that should just be discarded. But the hints uh, about fidelity, since there was no fidelity measure, was, were found in some of the data. Uh, over 25 percent of the money that was being spent uh, out of this 500 million was being spent on services provided in 
caseworker offices. So let's see, we have home-based services being delivered in an office. Uh, that little less than zero fidelity, I don't know, is there like militant non-fidelity? I, 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 there, there's got to be something, it, you know, uh, uh, I don't even know what to call it. So, but it's so far off the chart. Um, but, but the thing is, Home Builders was labeled as an intervention failure. It's taken them 25 years to recover from that. It was effective before, it was effective during, it's been effective after, uh, but it was labeled as a failure because it was not implemented well. Um, we are, well anyway, that is a big, big problem. The current federal spending based on exactly the same premise. Uh, we have $100 billion that's going into these innovative programs in education. Uh, Arne Duncan and uh, President Obama invested heavily in this, and this is a uh, huge investment in innovations in education. $63 billion is about to be announced for maternal uh, health uh, programs through the, the U.S. State Department, the USAID uh, initiatives. Uh, as we heard yesterday uh, from our speaker, uh, Brian Samuels, uh, and I don't know if it's $4 billion or some other number, but it's a lot of money uh, for home visiting programs that's uh, being uh, funded through uh, the Administration for Children, Youth, and Families. And again, in not, not in any of this funding is there uh, any money set aside uh, to support implementation of the, those interventions that they have in mind. So the same formula is still being applied uh, even in these massive funding initiatives. So we have all of this new money uh, that's available, hundreds of billions of our taxpayer dollars <laughs> that are going down the same old rat hole. And we did not get benefit from this. Uh, we collectively in this room uh, for evidence-based programs, we are dedicated to those. We see the value in these. Um, but without the supports for the implementation, uh, more things now are going to be labeled as failures. Um, when we saw the money that was being invested in home visiting uh, programs, uh, four billion, give or take whatever, uh, our very first call was to uh, Peggy Hill at uh, Nurse Family Partnership, said this could be the end of Nurse Family Partnership if you're not careful. Uh, you absolutely have to make sure that you insist on uh, having a fidelity assessment for every one of these things and whatever you do back out of it You know refuse to participate Don't allow anybody to use your program if it's not being done with fidelity because here's the home builder story So and I also want to apologize that any resemblance to anybody you happen to might know that looks like that purely coincidental elected or otherwise So Karen says, you know, well, all right, so what? So the, so what is the purpose is to produce greater benefits to children, families, individuals, and society. That, that's what the evidence-based program movement is all about. And uh, what we know so far is that so far, not so good. Uh, we have evidence-based programs. They are not being supported in practice, and we are not getting uh, the benefits out of these that are uh, the promise, really, of evidence-based work. In implementation science, as we reviewed the literature, uh, the very best data we had, and here we do have randomized control trials, multiple fields, uh, but these uh, methods, when used alone, keep that in mind, when used alone, are insufficient. So this whole diffusion dissemination of information that goes on everywhere, training by itself, uh, spray and pray, train and hope, sit and get, uh, there's lots of little, uh, you know, ways of talking about that. Um, not sufficient. Laws, mandates, funding, incentives, organizational change, reorganization. I mean, how many of us have gone through all of those? Every one of those things is important. But it's focusing on any one of those things at a time is the problem. So we will see more later about how we can integrate these things. Uh, but these are the things that we do. Uh, so... When the federal government is funding these huge initiatives, 
they're really relying on the diffusion dissemination of information part of things. They're really relying on, on one-shot training, if at all, uh, to do that. And of course, they're passing the laws and making and the mandates and incentivizing this uh, with funding. Uh, but it is insufficient to go down that path. And again, uh, doing these things one at a time like this, uh, the 5 to 20 percent show up. 5 to 20 percent of the people find some way of making it work even under these less uh, than optimal conditions. What do we end up with? What you're looking at here are literacy scores and look at the bottom line. These are age 9 See, these are kids who are in third grade. Uh, for those of you who can't see, uh, on the left-hand side, the date is 1971. So we have here 40 years of data on literacy of nine-year-old and the other kids uh, in the United States of America. Th this is the product of our education system. In 1971, uh, uh, the U.S. Department of Education as a cabinet level uh, department didn't even exist. That came into uh, being in 1980 to really focus attention on education. Let's see, 1980 uh, went from 215 to 211. This is on a 500 point scale, by the way, just to give you an idea where 210-20 is. Um, the amount of money that the federal government was putting into education in those days was minuscule, maybe two or three, four billion dollars a year. Now it's uh, well, over a hundred billion plus uh, that goes in from the federal government. So over that period of time, uh, how much difference has that made? Uh, not a lot. Um, how many evidence-based programs and approaches to literacy, to math, to uh, kids' behavior in school to you fill in the blank uh, have come and gone and how many reforms have come and gone in this 40-year period of time and where are the impacts and there are none and for anybody familiar with the medical field when you see a flat line like that flat line means you are dead, dead. thank you so and it's just convenient to have uh, the uh, information from education uh, because uh, they have these data collected by the Institutes for Education Sciences. Uh, they have hundred and some thousand kids uh, randomly selected, stratified uh, for each of these data points uh, at each of these age groups. Uh, we are doing a miserable job. No wonder we are 28th out of 30 developed countries around the world uh, in education, and yet we spend more by far uh, than anybody else. So it's not about the money, it's about what are we doing with the money. Implementation has never been a national goal per se, but goals that can be achieved only by effectively implementing new technology have been inherent in many national programs. Uh, that was true certainly recently, and that was true back in 1975 when Huff uh, first uh, gave us that quote. So we have this new golden age. We have the science to service. We have this big gap that we all know about uh, that needs to be filled. A problem we face that is not faced by some of our colleagues in other fields is the fact that in human services, our work is all interaction based. It's people interacting with people, therapists with clients. It's, it's uh, MSD therapist with a family, it's a teacher with a student, and so on and so on. Inherently more complex than any of the atom-based stuff where you're, you're developing a software program, you're doing something on a manufacturing line, you're uh, doing whatever. Atom-based ingredients don't talk back, they don't run away, they don't, you know, spit in your face. Uh, it, it is uh, inherently simpler than what we face. But this, this is, I mean, we could go on a lot about complexity, but uh, suffice it to say. But this means that in human services, the practitioner is the intervention. What that practitioner does on a day-to-day -day basis with those people uh, that he or she is interacting with, that is where the intervention occurs. That is where the benefits will be realized. You want to know what the production unit is in education? It's the teacher. You want to know what the production unit is in mental health? It's the therapist. Uh, that is where the benefits are being produced. So what do the rest of us do? 
everything and everybody else needs to be aligned with supporting those teachers, those practitioners, those therapists, so they can do the, the work that they need to do, do it effectively and do it efficiently. So we're not talking about science to service, we're talking about science in service. And that's where the implementation part of this really comes to be. And we think that this science to service gap, it's not about, not just about uh, not using evidence-based programs. Uh, we think there's a, a significant implementation gap. Uh, we're not using evidence-based programs with fidelity. When we are using them with fidelity, we're not sustaining them for any period of time. It lasts as long as the funding lasts. It lasts as long as those people happen to be there and some unique combination lasts. Um, and even when we get past that, we're not using this on a scale to move that line for those nine-year-old kids. We are not seeing this happen. And, uh, and, but to, my, I, have, I have a personal uh, pledge that I've made to myself. I'm going to see that nine-year-old line move before I die. I'm already 70, so you guys better get on the ball. So hey, we're doing the best we can here, right? Uh, so uh, we're, we're, we're trying to make our uh, progress. Um, a few years ago, we had a chance to uh, review and synthesize the literature. We looked across disciplines, sectors, nations, etc. Ended up with the uh, implementation uh, synthesis, the monograph. Uh, you can download this for free at the uh, website. Just Google NIRN and you will find uh, all of that. And in there, you'll find uh, the formula for success. And here, here's what we need to start thinking about very, very seriously, and what Dell referred to earlier uh, today and, and yesterday. We have effective interventions. That's what Blueprints is all about. That's what other people are working hard to produce. Uh, and we need effective implementation supports for those interventions. And it's those two things together that produce effective outcomes. But notice that this is a multiplication problem. Any number times zero is? Thank you. Uh, zero. So if all we invest in is the intervention and we are not putting our effort and our money and our, uh, our science into the implementation side of this, we are continuing to get what we have gotten for the last 50 years that I'm aware of, and that is pretty poor outcomes when it comes to having uh, evidence-based programs used in service uh, environments. So this recognition is uh, very, very important. So an intervention is one thing. We're going to put all of our interventions on that wall. Implementation is another thing. We're going to put that on this wall. And believe me, you could not be looking at two things any more, uh, that are any more different than that. Uh, it is something else altogether. We like to think about this like serum and a syringe. Serums over here, uh, absolutely. There's a science behind it. It has certain chemical compositions and on and on. Um, over here is the syringe, but can you think of anything different, uh, more different than developing a serum <laughs> and developing a syringe? And it better have a very sharp little tiny needle because I don't want anybody sticking me with any of that stuff because I don't like any of it. But each one of these things is necessary. What are you going to do with the, with the serum if you don't have a syringe to deliver it? You're going to take a bath in it. I've tried rubbing it on my head. It didn't work. Uh, I mean, what, what do you do? You need the delivery system, and that's what the implementation part of this uh, is all about. So when you go back home in your, uh, your autocorrect function on your word processor, uh, whenever you, you know, type in the word uh, innovation, intervention, evidence-based program, whatever you're going to put there, but have it always come up to be that and implementation so that you cannot think of one of these things again without thinking of the other. Because one without the other is not going to get you very far. So, yeah, we're doing the best we can. Karen says, yeah, but are you doing what's required? Oh, my God. I mean, doing the best I can, I, that feels kind of good. Are you doing what's required? Oh, may, maybe not. So, okay. So, what's required? This is where active implementation uh, starts to come into the picture. So active implementation, we're going to talk quickly about implementation teams, implementation drivers, implementation stages, and improvement cycles. 
And I'm sorry this does not exactly correspond with all the stuff that's in your uh, manual, but they wanted things and I sent it to them and then I finished this up this morning. So, um, but all of this is also on websites, etc. These things were derived from that literature review. These are the things when people say, well, are these evidence-based approaches to implementation? It's based on the best available evidence uh, it's thin evidence, but it's the best available evidence. It's also based on some of the practice uh, uh, reviews that we have done. We'll get to that in a minute. So instead of the letting it happen, helping it happen, we are now in the third category, and that is making it happen. And this is not some heavy-handed approach. This is making uh, purposeful use of implementation science uh, in order to uh, bring about the changes that we would like to see in order to get evidence-based programs into typical service environments. That's what making it happen is about. Uh, and in this case, it's no longer up to you. It's now up to us. We have implementation teams that get formed. Uh, purveyor groups uh, are there for individual uh, evidence-based programs. Implementation teams are there to support implementation of most any evidence-based or even uh, just an effective uh, alternative to what is going on. But the implementation, now the accountability shifts from the practitioner uh, to the implementation team, a very important thing. What defines an implementation team? Uh, a minimum of three people. Uh, and these are people with uh, not just the title, but with the expertise to actually do implementation well. So some of the things we're about to talk about, um, to promote effective, efficient, and sustainable implementation of programs, organizational change, systems transformation work. Those three things go hand in glove in uh, whatever a third thing is. You need three things. Um, hand in glove and glove bigger. Um, so, uh, but. But to think that we're going to change practice without changing the organizations in which those practices are done, get over it. Uh, that is, uh, it is a requirement. Once you start changing organizations, you are automatically into the systems reinvention business. We have to plan for this, and we'll talk more about those things. Why do we say three or more? Three or more make up a team. Teams are sustainable. Individuals are not. Uh, when you have somebody who is a dynamite person who's been the implementation go-getter for your organization for the last 10 years uh, leaves, everything goes out the door with that individual. With a team, with three people, you have a chance to recover. You have a chance to sustain uh, the expertise and to keep it going uh, in a very positive way. What makes an implementation team uh, useful. What does? How can they do things so much better, so much quicker uh, than individuals, or in this, or having you just figured out on your own where you're responsible? It's because they are working at all of these levels simultaneously. They have their fingers in all of those pies out there. They're working to develop practitioner competency while they're helping the organization accommodate uh, these new things while they're helping the regional folks uh, learn how to fund this in a better way, while they are, I mean, on and on. We, we have used this so many times, people think this is our hip hop sign. You know, I, I don't know the little dance and how you do the thing, uh, but they, they now know this is the NERN sign when we go like that. So I, I don't know what that means in hip hop terms, but I'm too old for all of that, but uh, I thought I'd pass that on. I don't know why, uh, but... Um, the, so here's the other thing about implementation teams. Uh, we know from Prochaska's work uh, in organizations that at any given time, about 20% of individuals and in their uh, work, about 20% of organizations are ready for change. So, uh, and that's where in the, the gold color, uh, I think it's gold, uh, uh, the implementation team is working to help those people who are ready actually uh, uh, implement uh, the evidence-based program or programs and, uh, and, and accomplish the assured or, the, or accomplish the uh, benefits that are intended from that. But what about the other 
If we really want to produce uh, change at a societal level, uh, what are we going to do? We're just going to wait for them to be ready someday? Here we are again, variation around this mediocre mean. Uh, by the time those people are ready, the other people are gone. You know, it's, uh, you're, you never get anywhere. So we have to learn how to create readiness in those uh, that are uh, not the ones who are in the pick me group uh, that you start with. So what do you do with the other 80%? And again, that's where the implementation team is working with all the people named there uh, to actually uh, bring about some of this change. So here we are with innovations. And what we know most about innovations is what it is that we want practitioners and staff to do in order to produce the desired outcomes for children, families, communities, and so forth. Innovation outcomes result from adult interactions with children, families, and others. So that's, that's that interactive uh, kind of component that we had talked about before. This is what we know a lot about. This is what we need if, in fact, we are really serious about taking things to scale, to actually producing benefits for society. And what we need is an inf in infrastructure for implementation. Agencies of any size need to have their implementation team, the one team three to five members I just described with the specialized expertise. Where do they come from? Well, we need regional implementation teams who are helping the local implementation team. Where do they come from? Well, we need state ones to help develop the regional ones. Uh, and so this, and all of this being done uh, under the aegis of the State Department of whatever. But it's, it's infrastructure for implementation that is the missing part. This is why all that money goes down those big rat holes, uh, because we don't have this kind of capacity built into human services uh, not health, not education, not social services, not mental health, not substance abuse, not any of them. Uh, but this is what we need. And this is what has been developed already in the last uh, 30 years around information technology. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, we each had our own little desktop computer built by one or another group, uh, had proprietary software, uh, yours didn't talk to mine, uh, often we couldn't even uh, get uh, any help because, well, gee, that's a, that kind and I only know about this kind. Uh, so, but that's not the case today. We now have imp uh, information technology departments. We have created an infrastructure because it is important to uh, the uh, conduct of human services to have this go on. So having infrastructures is nothing new. We have infrastructures for finance, we have infrastructures for IT, and so on. Now we need an infrastructure to support implementation. And this is, this is now uh, within our ability uh, to get done. Why are we so hot about these teams? Why are we thinking that implementation teams that take accountability for helping you accomplish your goals with these uh, innovations, uh, it's right here. If you have an effective uh, innovation, effective intervention, a blueprints program, uh, and you have an implementation team who is skillful at all of these implementation components, uh, you can get about 80% success in three years, maybe four years. This is 80% of the schools or districts. This is 80% of the clinics. This is 80% of the fill in the blank. Um, but there's a lot of data now from NIH on the other side that says without this, if you're just letting it happen, helping it happen, uh, if you're in that mode, uh, you get about 14% success and it takes about 17 years. 14%, 17 years, here we are turning around that mediocre mean. We are not going to be moving uh, that literacy line uh, anytime soon. So the reason is you, it makes a big difference. When we talk to policy makers, we now say you can make a choice. You can keep doing what you've always done and 14, if you wait 17 years, uh, how old will you be then and where will you be? Okay, not here, not. 14% um, success is what you can expect. Um, if you'd like to see change more quickly and more purposefully, you need to invest in this implementation infrastructure. Let's look at costs and savings. This is a little bit of data we have from our own work, uh, some of what Dell was talking about earlier. 
Uh, back in the 80s, we were in the business of creating implementation teams and uh, going from one residential care facility to another with the Teaching Family Program. Uh, here are the budgets for uh, several organizations. Uh, we took all the budgets and just made it 100 uh, for the one year prior to our arrival. During the time, though, that we were creating the change in that organization, we were building the implementation capacity, we were uh, installing the, uh, the evidence-based uh, approach, that cost extra money. Why does it cost extra money? Because you don't shut down the place to, to retool and then reopen it. You know, uh, here in our, uh, our um, uh, juvenile justice facility, uh, we, we're gonna, it's going to take us about a year and a half probably to get all of this retooled. So uh, you guys, your parents take all your kids home and you sheriffs and, and whatever, take all the kids because we're going to close the place and retool and then we'll reopen uh, next fall. Uh, that, that is not how it happens in human services. So we have to build the new while we still are operating the current system. One more degree of complexity. Uh, but again, this is quite possible to do, but it costs a little extra money because you're now doing some duplicate things for a period of time. The during time there might be a year, might be two, two and a half years, depending on the complexity of what you're dealing with and how much change has to occur. But notice what happens afterwards. Now you are not only doing a more effective job, you're doing a more efficient job. So by investing in implementation capacity during that uh, during time, uh, you now have improved not only effectiveness but efficiency. And well, why is that? And in school environments where people have been doing this for a while, if you are teaching kids literacy by age nine, they know how to read. And from uh, age 10 on, they can read to learn. You don't need to hire tutors. You don't need to have specialized after school. You, you start saving a lot of money on all the things that are there right now to support ineffective approaches. So what are the active implementation? We're going to hurry through a couple of these things. So implementation drivers. These are the things that need to be done in every organization uh, in order to uh, actually produce, reliably produce the kind of changes that you want to see. And again, this, this is nothing that we made up. This is stuff that we drive from the literature and drive from talking with our colleagues uh, who do this stuff for a living and do it, do it, do it very, very well. Karen Blasey, when she was here, uh, showed you uh, all of this. This is the implementation triangle. These are the implementation drivers. Uh, there's uh, competency. If every innovation, every evidence-based program, every blueprints program is by definition a new way of doing work. Well, how do you learn new ways of doing work? Well, there has to be some way of improving the competency uh, of the people who are uh, delivering the service. And again, if you're doing that, you also have to be paying attention to the organizational side of this. If you want those things to be sustained, if you want training, coaching, performance assessments done in this way, the organization has to accommodate that and has to support that. Uh, it also has to be able to support the practitioners doing their new ways of work. Uh, how much paperwork can we get rid of? How much can we take off their backs? Because if we've just invested all this time to have them become proficient at doing uh, uh, treatment this way, education this way, health this way, we don't want them to be spending 40% uh, of their time filling out paperwork, we want them to be spending 80% of their time interacting with uh, the clients. Leadership, absolutely critical, many forms of that. All of this has to be integrated. And if we do this well, we then have a high, per, a high uh, fidelity performance, and that leads to consistent uses of the innovation, the evidence-based program. Uh, and if we do that, we get reliable benefits. I mean, there is uh, the linkage. Now, here is where interventions and implementation come together, is around fidelity. If we have high fidelity, what do we have? We have better outcomes. And remember, that's part of the definition of a program. You already know this because you've, you've uh, demonstrated this as part of your program. But without having fidelity in there, 
we are we have a missing link we don't know how to link up all the things that we're trying to do to support practitioners and have that and have us say that in fact uh, this is in some way uh, uh, linked to the outcomes that we're getting so we we need to have this fidelity assessment in there this is the critical thing so when we are looking at implementation what is the immediate outcome of implementation done well what's the immediate outcome of everything on the implementation triangle we are we judge good implementation by the fidelity it produces in practitioners so if we have lots of practitioners uh, who are at high fidelity we know we're doing implementation work well uh, if it's spotty we need a lot of work if it's not there at all we need to create these supports so that is the immediate outcome uh, for um, uh, for implementation and it is then the independent variable it is the thing <laughs> then that leads to uh, the uh, consistent uses of the innovation and the benefits that we want to see over and over and over again uh, many thousand times so staff training you know all these things on the left hand side selection training coaching you also have data on all of those Staff training without pre post assessment of knowledge and skill acquisition during training is a meeting. It's not training. Coaching. Where does coaching fit into this? Well, training done really well, theory, discussion, and demonstration, and practice and feedback uh, to some criterion, hopefully, during training, that is fantastic. And if you look at the use, this is a meta analysis that Joyce and Showers did a few years ago of lots of uh, training uh, and uh, uh, coaching uh, work in um, education. But they got about 5%. So here we are again with that 5 to 15% that somehow figure out how to do it on their own. But you add in coaching and it's, five, it's 95%, not 5% of the teachers who are actually using the innovation uh, in the classroom. So just like with implementation teams, we get to choose here we get to choose again do we want to have five percent do we want to have ninety five percent and if we want ninety five percent we are going to invest in having coaches who know how to do coaching coaching is not a title Tote coaching is a set of functions and those functions produce those kinds of results here we are today engaging in ineffective behavior uh, so I'm d giving you theory discussion I don't expect any of you to go out and do one thing differently tomorrow. So totally useless. You might know a little bit, um, but that's about it. Staff performance, fidelity. Uh, here's some data from the teaching family program way back when. Uh, the three uh, groups on the left are low fidelity. And you notice there are high uh, delinquency outcomes, so not a very good uh, performance. The three on the right are high fidelity uh, groups and delinquency uh, is much lower. The delinquency we measured, used to measure this was the uh, newly developed uh, self-report delinquency measure by Dell Elliott and colleagues. So it tells you uh, this is, went back a ways. It says 1988, but the data were actually collected in the late 70s right after Dell uh, enlightened us with his uh, new, new methods. 30 years later, here's functional family therapy. Functional family therapy, and down the uh, left-hand side are 25 therapists. And they're all, uh, have all been trained and, uh, and using functional family therapy. It's the same functional family therapy that's on the blueprints list. And so the, the intervention has not changed at all. Uh, what we see, though, is that Here's the control group at 22%. That's the yellow line running down the middle. Here are the high fidelity performers. They have 13% recidivism uh, compared to the 22% for the control group. Here are the low fidelity performers. They are at 28% recidivism compared to the 22% for the control group. Fidelity matters. It mattered back in the 70s and it matters today. So it's not just the program. The program's the same. It was the same for the teaching family program. It's the same for FFT. What matters is how well is this being used? How well is it being used? That's the product of implementation done well. 
The other thing is stages. This is one area that uh, is overlooked. Uh, there are exploration, installation, initial, and full implementation stages that we've derived from the literature and again from our colleagues who are doing this work uh, well around uh, the globe. Exploration is what most of us are, are familiar with. That how do you find out about something? How do you know you go to websites? This is where the dissemination, diffusion information is very, very useful. So those things that didn't work by themselves for implementation purposes work really well for exploration. It gets people interested, even though you're not going to go and do anything differently with respect to implementation tomorrow, you will know something and you, you will leave here uh, knowing a little bit more about implementation. So the exploration stage is a lot of information exchange leading up to a mutual decision to proceed. The implementation team says, yep, we think you can do it. And the organization is saying, yes, we want to do it. We realize it's going to cost a little bit more, that little funding bump. Uh, and we know it's going to upset the apple carts here in a big way, but we're, we're willing to do that. Installation stage, uh, all but overlooked in human services. Uh, but this is where you, you've made the decision to go, but you can't go yet. You don't have the resources together. You don't have, where, where are you going to get training? Who's, who's going to be the coach? Where are we going to find those people? Do we have space? Oh, how about computer? Oh, they need travel because uh, it's a home base program. Do we have an easy way to reimburse that? Blah, blah, blah. Installation is very, very important. And for those people who are not prepared, guess what? In the uh, attempt to implement an evidence-based program stops before they're even getting to the point of attempting to use the evidence-based program. So they can't even get their act together uh, to approach it. Initial implementation, your first newly trained practitioner is working with the, the first real uh, clients that you have in your program, uh, and this is where the fun really begins. And so the, uh, but how, how do things go when you first start to do something that is uh, skillful? Uh, anybody learn how to play piano, learn how to play golf? I mean, anything that takes some skill, how well do we do this initially? We are bad. Uh, and so are our practitioners. They are not comfortable with this. How do you get the words out? Is this the right sequence? What, I mean, so many things are turning around. Uh, this is called the awkward stage. And so because it's not comfortable for anybody. And the organization hasn't yet learned to support this. And your peers are kind of looking at you a little cross-eyed. And students are wondering in classrooms, what's wrong with Miss Smith? I mean, she's funny. Uh, acting today. So they go home and tell their parents who come to talk to the principal. So it's, uh, I mean, this, this is the awkward stage. Uh, but you get through this. But this is where the coaches, this is, this is where the implementation team and the coaching built into an implementation team helps people through this. It helps them say, no, no, this is fine. It's just how it's supposed to be. This, you're doing exactly the right thing. Uh, so let's uh, keep going. And if you do that, you can reach uh, the other side and get into full implementation. Full implementation, we define, and this is an arbitrary definition, uh, but uh, it's also a definition that a uh, handful of uh, uh, programs ever reach. But it's where you have 50% or more of all of the people who are in your practitioner spots who are supposed to be using the evidence-based program are using it with fidelity. They have met the fidelity criteria. So half or more met fidelity. The other half are still working to achieve fidelity. And you want to mark that day down with a big uh, red uh, marker of some kind uh, because a week from now, a month from now, you will no longer be at full implementation because somebody left, somebody got sick, uh, you had the next uh, fidelity assessment, they didn't meet criteria. Fidelity is not forever. It's re-earned uh, re -earned every single time. But full implementation uh, is, uh, is uh, defined in that way. Now let's look at the right-hand side for intervention outcomes. Um, exploration, installation, initial implementation. How much of the program is in place during those stages? Not very much. And yet we have our uh, funders who are saying, uh, we're going to give you six months, and then in month seven, we're gonna, we want you to start tracking outcomes for the kids, for the 
uh, adults that you are uh, treating. And where are you there? You're probably in the awkward stage where, if anything, things have gotten just a little bit worse, not better, because you've upset all the routines. Um, so that is a very poor time uh, to go in search of uh, uh, outcomes. And yet, this is the situation that many people face. So why do we find so many things? We tried this. The organization tried it. Uh, we did the independent outcome uh, assessment and we found that the evidence-based program didn't work. Well, what didn't work was the funder insist insisting on doing this prematurely. Uh, Dobson and Cook back in the 80s dubbed this a type three error. You know about type one, type two. Type three error is trying to evaluate a program that does not exist. That's a type three error. It's not there, and yet you're trying to collect outcome data and say, attribute it somehow or the other to a program that doesn't exist. The only time that you can do that uh, with any kind of uh, sense of uh, confidence is when you've reached full implementation. You have a measure of fidelity and you have a measure of outcome and you can relate those two things together uh, just as we saw in the FFT study. A few years ago, yeah, we're going to go quickly here, we had uh, many people who were in this room uh, to a series of meetings. Uh, these are people who are doing evidence-based work uh, uh, as for a living and uh, we're doing it very well. You noticed all kinds of things, uh, nutrition programs for the elderly, MST, FFT, dialectical behavior therapy, etc. But what we wanted to know was what went on during uh, the stages of implementation. And here are some of the things, when we did concept mapping, we did nominal group process, we've done interviews, uh, this work continues. But during exploration, some, some things made sense to us. During exploration, a lot of assessment activities is what uh, folks were describing to us. 97% uh, of all of the assessment activities described by the uh, informants in these, uh, in these, act, in these uh, meetings, uh, uh, they put that into the exploration stage. Another thing that made sense to us was that selection, training, coaching, evaluation, many of the organizational development things all of that happened during the initial implementation. That, that's where you're getting all of this started. You're getting into that awkward stage, but uh, you can't get, uh, get through that until you get it started. So those are the things there. What surprised us were these two things. Planning started early and intensified over time. We thought there would be a ton of planning in the exploration and installation and that that would fall off, but it was just the other way around. The farther you get into it, the more you know about it, and then the more plans that are being made. And that was, that was sort of interesting. Systems intervention. Now here was a biggie. We thought, you know, once the program was up and running and you start bumping into issues, that's when you would start looking at systems intervention, or intervening in the system to do this, well, no, no. Uh, the purveyors, these people who have been doing this work said, the only time you really have leverage is, the, is before you start. And so if you want to have the system change how they're going to refer, how they're going to pay, how they're going to do uh, their certification and accreditation, I mean, you fill in the blank, your best leverage is the day before you start. And so they had learned this. So a lot of the system uh, intervention work was being done during exploration and during uh, installation. Uh, that was uh, a very interesting thing. So, so there's, it's pretty cool to see how this stuff plays out. So here we are. Uh, we want to have in the top corner here outcomes uh, for uh, the children, families, and others. We're going to use effective evidence-based programs to achieve that. Who is going to be working to uh, produce those effects? Our producers of uh, outcomes are the practitioners, staff, administrators, board members. How will they learn to do that? That's where the implementation drivers come into play. Um, the implementation drivers and stages. Uh, so implementation teams now are going to be the ones uh, who are going to be helping uh, the practitioners, staff, administrators, boards uh, learn how to support practitioners. So you see the logic here. There is fidelity at the intervention level We've talked about that. There is also fidelity at the implementation level. So we now have measures to assess 
the quality of the work of an implementation team. So just like you have measures to assess the quality of work of a practitioner, uh, we now have measures to assess the quality of the work there. So fidelity applies to everybody, it, uh, and uh, this accountability at the implementation team level is very important. So what do we want to do? That's the evidence-based program. How are we going to do it? This is the work of the people who are actually producing uh, the effects. And who is going to do the work of implementation? That's the big question, and that's the, the implementation teams. And again, purveyor groups uh, fit into uh, this more generic uh, kind of view. So implementation teams are critical. So let's go quickly to system supports, and I want to just take three minutes for this. Because all this work we've been talking about um, systems will squash evidence-based programs. They will not support uh, uh, organizations that are making good use of this. Uh, even big parts of systems will go away uh, without having the system itself change to support these things. So uh, we, we learned this the hard way over 20 years, and now we need to plan for it, expect it, and deal with it. We have a chance to do this. State implementation, scaling up of evidence-based practices in education. Uh, don't have time to go into a lot of that, but uh, we're, we're looking at taking on uh, and building this uh, implementation infrastructure in whole uh, state education systems, and we've been working in six states. What this means, though, is going from the supply side to the demand side. On the supply side, which is where almost everybody in this room and we for many, many years uh, uh, did our work, uh, there's only a little bit of us and there's a whole lot of people out there in that big human service environment. So where do we go? We go where we are most welcome. Uh, we do our readiness work and if you're ready to go and you're able to do it and you have the capacity built in, uh, we're gonna go uh, help you. Uh, and that has created these islands of excellence. We have uh, places here and there that are doing superb work. The demand side sa says, we want this benefit for everybody. Every student in every school in our entire state. Every uh, mental health recipient in every clinic in our entire state. Uh, and keep going. We want a sea of change. So here's what happens right now. We have the existing system. Systems are extremely powerful. No news to anybody in the room. And so as soon as you introduce an innovation, the system starts fooling around with the innovation. Uh, well, that's not a very good fit. I understand it's a 12-step 12 12 program, but you know we only have uh, room for six here. Um, we know it's a 90 minutes uh, that's required for uh, this literacy program to work, but that's so upsetting to our school schedule, we're gonna have it fit into the 55 minutes available, and there won't be any uh, follow-up uh, remedial work uh, that's a part of doing literacy work well. Um, so already the system starts to uh, adapt programs before they're ever off the ground. What we wanna see is over on the right-hand side. Let's take these effective interventions and say, what does the system need to do and what do organizations need to do to change to better support these, fully support these, because it is the outcomes from these things that we really want to see. So here's a system, little view. Uh, all this weight on the bottom, compliance and so on, mandates, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the lightning rod at the top is where the leaders are responding to one crisis after another. Uh, this is the system in which we all, uh, systems in which we all work. How do you begin to change a system? Well, the very first thing is we need to have evidence-based practices that are implemented fully. We're going we're gonna to go in and we're going to do this with fidelity and we're going to demonstrate the outcomes uh, right away. And our purpose, we guarantee you, we tell people at the state and federal level, uh, this will disturb the system. Part of our function is to disturb the system because if the system as is is producing those 40 years worth of literacy data, that system needs to change, wouldn't you think? Yes, uh, they do. So, but this is the, the wedge. This is the way in. 
And it's not a hundred of these things, it's one. Pick one, do it extremely well, and you will be on your way. So how to do that? How to take advantage of that? Uh, here is the system that we are currently functioning in. We have state management teams, uh, regional ones, federal ones, but we'll stick with state for here. Uh, and they say, we want evidence-based work. We, we demand it, as a matter of fact. In some states, they even legislate it, uh, that they're going to have uh, the, uh, these practitioners uh, who are listed at the bottom here making use of effective uh, uh, innovations in order to produce benefits to children, families, individuals, and others. And that's as far as it's gone. This is still in the letting it happen, helping it happen mode. Hey, legislators and policymakers, they've done your job. We, we told you this is what we want. Uh, we ask you, uh, this is it. We even passed some laws that said we demand that this happen uh, in our state. Uh, I mean, we have done our work. And so we are enabling you guys at the practice level to do things differently. And how does that work? Well, we've seen the evidence that doesn't work very well. So pay attention. Here's where the changes start to occur. The first thing is systems are all but incapable of changing themselves because everybody in the system is a part of the system and that's, they've been acculturated to it and that is uh, it. So you need some external uh, uh, force that comes in and says, Thing, here, we're going to help you change. We, we can provide a view of you that you cannot provide uh, for yourself. But notice what came in with that was the implementation team. So that implementation team now is starting to actually do the work, actually implement that, yeah, remember that thin edge of the wedge business, getting an evidence-based program up and running, uh, having practitioners learn how to use that, uh, and producing the benefits that you want to see. You have demonstrated the ability of this uh, evidence-based program to make the changes that are desirable. You have demonstrated the ability of the uh, Im implementation team to carry this out. Now, that is a big step in the right direction, but not sustainable, not scalable. So what does make the next big difference? And here's where it took us about five years to finally uh, get this one figured out. Uh, but, and here, I'll do it again, just in case you were looking away. Uh, it is the practice to policy communication loop. This is what discriminated the failures for systems change from the successes. And this is taking information from the practice level right back to the very people who said, we want this change. We want you to be using evidence-based programs at the practice level. But notice this does not go up the middle. This goes around the current bureaucracy right back to the uh, decision makers. That's fraught with its own set of problems. No time to talk about that here. But the, but the, and this happens every month, month after month after month. So the policymakers who said they wanted the change, they want the better outcomes, they are hearing about what it is that they have done in the past and are doing now that's helpful. And they're hearing about the two or three things that they need to do next month to get rid of barriers, and getting rid of barriers is almost always uh, the first thing. But after you start working on this for a while, you start then actually bringing about changes in the system itself. You start sorting through those things that are helpful in the system, those things that are impediments. The things that are impediments are either changed or eliminated uh, by the decision makers. Uh, and you start to get a leaner, more effective, and more efficient uh, uh, system. Education, mental health, substance abuse, juvenile justice, what have you. Tons of stuff on that, we won't linger. Uh, so capacity building. Short-term funding. This federal funding, these billions of dollars that are available, ought to be invested in creating this, these implementation teams, this implementation structure, that way that the organization systems reinvention parts of this are there. When the money goes away, the capacity is still there. As a matter of fact, the capacity can feed on itself in a very uh, positive way. Very, very important. So finally, 
Children, families, and individuals cannot benefit from services they do not experience. So pretty obvious, wouldn't you think? And yet we don't behave in that way. That is not how things get funded. That's not how things get done. We are not assuring the exposure of these children, families, and others to evidence-based programs. So we have to, to uh, implement uh, evidence-based programs with fidelity, sustain, improve their benefits on a socially significant scale. So here we are back again. We need to create this infrastructure uh, to uh, have this happen. Global Implementation Conference uh, happened last year. The next one will be in 2013. Uh, that's where a lot of this uh, information gets discussed. Uh, 800 and some people, 25 countries. Uh, we expect next time around is probably going to be a few more. But the, the, the focus on implementation, the focus on how you get this stuff uh, done uh, in a variety of, uh, of uh, uh, human service systems uh, is the focal point for uh, all of that. So, so with that, thank you very much. And we're going to take a few questions. <laughs> So question, question, I'm sorry that we have uh, like nine minutes here, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Could you say more about the practice informed policy aspects that you've discovered are so important? And how are they set up outside the system? Uh, the, this, when, when we go into uh, systems with scaling in mind, we start at the state level. So the very first thing, when we're going through the exploration installation, uh, on the uh, scalingup.org website, you will find uh, some uh, information about how we approach this at a state level not an organization, not a, not a clinical level, but a state level. So we get their permission uh, and their agreement to engage in this process. Uh, now, they don't know everything about it, uh, no, no way to describe it all, uh, but we get their agreement to participate in this. But the reason that you want that external uh, force that <laughs> over here, the advisors on the left-hand side, is to because we can go in from as outsiders and get their agreement to do that. And it's pretty amazing that about half of the states that we approached in education were quite willing to do that. And for after we uh, went through 18 of them and selected six, the other 12 said, well, we understand why we didn't, but could we just have that part, you know, the part that's here? Because uh, we think that is really what is going to be helpful to us. The other piece of this, though, is at the bottom. What, what has to be set up from the beginning is that this has to be a very constructive uh, uh, approach. Uh, so people at the practice level can't go there and just gripe and complain about all the old issues. This has to be focused. And again, something that the external folks help uh, to shape on the message and, uh, and which things are really uh, high priority. But this is, uh, this is the, uh, the real secret. I mean, along with the implementation drivers and stages, this is how the system change can start to happen. And the more people get into this, policymakers are like the rest of us. They're do-gooders. They want to do good. Uh, they, they don't, they're not out to not have their policies not work. I mean, that's not their goal. Uh, so as soon as they get a taste of this, they get the feedback, they just light up. Um, anyway, it, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Other questions? I can't see anything with the light, so somebody will have to speak up. <laughs> There's, oh, Bob. They're running over to you with mi multiple microphones. <laughs> this was really terrific, and I, I'm embarrassed that I wasn't already aware uh, of this, and it's very useful for a lot of the kinds of stuff that we that we deal with. Um, one of the issues, which actually is is uh, evoked by this very slide, uh, however, that I wanted to to touch on, 
we've, we've done a lot de dealing with states and with districts uh, as well. Uh, and th but there's a huge problem in terms of building capacity because they completely turn over every once in a while and everything is burned to the ground. I mean, it's, it, it, it's almost the more you penetrate, the more likely it is that the next administration will, will want to not merely fail to follow through, but actually to destroy that which was created by the previous administration. <laughs> and as a result, we've, we've kind of then used those structures for a period of time, knowing that they won't last, and trying to create things that are, that are more bottom-up and that will survive Right. at a lower level, a change of administration. Right. How do you think about that? Oh, uh, we think about that a lot, because <laughs> that is a big problem. But that's where the implementation team and the infrastructure for implementation really comes into being. What we, when we go to talk to school boards, either at the district level or at the state level, uh, we ask them, uh, so when your new superintendent, state or uh, district, came in, uh, in the job description, uh, was there anything that allowed them to decide, you know, that finance uh, accounting system, that whole infrastructure we have there, that costs us a lot of money. During my administration, we're going to do away with that. Uh, and we're going to save tons of money by not accounting for money. Uh, is, is that part of the job? Oh, well, no. I mean, we've got to have that. Uh, well, okay. So implementation needs to be in the same uh, mode. Uh, it's got to be in the place where you cannot imagine not having your finance, your IT, and your implementation infrastructure there. So what does that mean? It means changing job descriptions. It means changing how you interview for the next person. It mean, but that, as soon as we get our foot in the door at the district level, as soon as we get our foot in the door at the state level, uh, one of the things we start doing is starting to change those structural things so how, how are people selected? To have somebody selected who is going to come in and tear down uh, everything that somebody has spent 20 years building, that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and I don't care how good a football coach he was before becoming the superintendent, uh, it does not merit that. And so the, but we, we prime all the people around these people to not have that happen. Uh, so who are going to be the interviewers? What are they going to interview for? What's the job description? And in the job description, it says that here are the things you are going to support. And if you're going to accept the job, you're accepting that. And so they start interviewing on that basis. But it, it's changing those structural things, which is the, the systems change part of this. How do you get CEUs? How do you qualify to be uh, the leader of, a, of an agency, the, the head of a district in school, uh, you you, you got to change those things. But that's, that's the system, the powerful system. Those are the things that are built in that allow it, also uh, almost insist on it, continuing to behave in these ineffective ways. Now, is this a, a rapid pro process? This does not happen in a year or two. But we now believe this can happen in five to six years for an entire state education system. We think this can happen in five to six years for an entire child welfare system, uh, which are two that we're working in most uh, vigorously right now. Early childhood education is the next one, and rehabilitative he health is uh, on the, uh, another one that we're working with in Canada right now. But all these same principles are the things that we are uh, building in uh, as we go. So we have one time for one more question, and then we... Oh, I'm sorry. We have time for one more question, and I will talk to you after. Yes, sir. Um, I was really interested in what you said about uh, teachers being the production unit in education and clinicians as the production unit in health. And um, I wondered what you thought about sort of the intrinsic motivation of those production units because, you know, everybody wants to be effective, but everybody also wants to be auto autonomous and not just be a cog. So it seems coaching is probably where that balance is struck, but I wondered if you could speak to that. I, I like your answer. I mean, you're right on. So <laughs> it, uh, but, but here's where the selection, training, coaching all go together uh, so that over time uh, you are, uh, just as we were talking about uh, with Bob, uh, you don't select teachers who are against doing uh, literacy this way. You don't select teachers who are anti what you uh, are engaged in. And you do select teachers who agree to 
participate in training, participate in coaching, have regular fidelity assessments. Those are the things that are part of the job. I mean, you describe that like you describe teaching English or whatever uh, their job might be. Uh, so you, you, uh, you end up with a, uh, a system then that starts to produce people, start to deliver to you people who are uh, much more amenable to all the things that you are talking about. In the meantime, uh, you're looking for the volunteers, the ones who want to go first, the pick me group of teachers. Uh, you are working with them, you're providing some training, you're doing, as you said, a lot of coaching uh, to get them to the point of reaching fidelity. A key point about fidelity that we make over and over and over and over again is that almost every fidelity assessment we have ever seen sets the floor. This is not the best that it will ever be. This, this is enough to get you started. If you learn these things, you are going to be really good at doing this evidence-based program. And now your task is, in year two, three, four, and ten, to make this better and better and better. Now you can apply as much creativity as you want. You're still doing the program uh, within, with fidelity, uh, but you, you're taking this to places uh, that uh, no one has gone before. Uh, and it, it's, that's where the next innovation comes from. That's where the next thing that can be evaluated in the next randomized control trial comes from. So, but uh, time is up and thank you so much. Hey, thank you. That was great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Hope there's no heresy in there. <laughs> That's right. That was terrific. Um, because um, we are committed to evaluation, we'd like to ask all of you to take a, a moment, um, either now or at least sometime before you leave, and fill out the evaluation form that's in your packet. Uh, it's very important for us that we get uh, your feedback on all of the sessions you've attended and the plenary sessions. Uh, you can drop that off at the registration desk, but please be sure that you fill out an evaluation. It's hard to deal with a 20% response rate. Okay. All right, that takes uh, care of it for this morning. Uh, uh, attend the, the, the favorite session that you pick out, and we will see you next at lunch. <laughs>